Okay, so let's get going to the main event tonight. Are you guys ready? Tonight we'll be discussing a brief historical view of what shaped the de development of AI, the exciting opportunities thanks to the exponential growth in recent years of AI hardware, open source software, and its applications on human society, and the challenges in AI education and UC Berkeley's answers to the call for action. And lastly, we will wrap up with a Q&A session where Dr. Yang will shed some light on the mysteries of AI. So first, we have the founder of 7EDU Impact Academy, Jun Liu. Now here we have Dr. Alan Yang. He's the principal investigator at UC Berkeley, and he also founded the Augmented and Virtual Reality Autonomous Driving Master of Engineering degrees at UC Berkeley. Alan was born into a family of educators and started learning coding at, on the Apple II at just six years old. After graduating from the University of Illinois and specializing in computer vision and machine learning, he has been an innovator and educator in the Bay Area for the past 13 years. At UC Berkeley, he founded the Augmented and Virtual Reality Teaching and Degree Program and advises more than 100 undergraduate and 20 graduate students annually. He has also guest lectured at the Haas School of Business as well as for Fortune 500 CEOs. In the Silicon Valley, he has co-founded three startup companies and was the chief designer te and technician of two augmented and virtual reality smart glasses. He has also co-authored over 20 patents and over 50 publications. All right, okay, so thank you, Ryan. Thank you for um, like a brief introduction for Ellen for our next open class. And I'm so excited to uh, invite Dr. Yang today. And uh, thank you so much, Ellen, uh, squeeze some time for us and to you know fit your busy schedule. And I know you're very busy uh, from the introduction and everybody can tell. All right, so today actually we wanna just to put all the attention uh, to these questions. Actually, we prepared and also we grabbed it from the students and our parents. And uh, we would like to, you know, uh, know your opinion and uh, give the advice to our students. So the first question, I think is, a, is very big and very general. And actually the students, par parents, they asked the question about what is the trend of the computer science or AI over the next decades? Uh, you know, like the students, they apply for computer science major every single year and it's getting hotter and hotter. And there's no sign like people would like to, you know, change to some other major because they think that's the best major can bring, you know, very good pay for the job, you know. So what do you think about the trend of AI over the next decades? Well, uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, really glad to uh, be on this platform and talk about something that I know I learned myself, you know, about the trend of AI. Um, now, to start with, uh, you know, I can tell you guys a little bit about the trend of myself. Uh, my background um, is in uh, computer vision. Uh, you know, since I uh, started learning um, um, programming and, uh, and 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 then computer science and so on and so forth, I have always been fascinated about analyzing images. You know, because people are saying that one you know one image is worth one thousand words, um, and also because uh, uh, the human brain is very sophisticated in terms of understanding images. So that actually is uh, you know the the the, the holy grail. Uh, of a computer, one of the holy grails of computer science is to, you know, let the computer to act, uh, you know, like the um, the human brain to be under, uh, to be able to understand images. Uh, so, you know, I set up my study uh, in this area, um, you know, for the past, uh, you know, uh, uh, many many years. Um, and uh, when I graduated from my PhD program uh, in 2006, um, you know, uh, AI or computer vision and so on and so forth. Um, uh, were not as hot as today. The reason at that time was because it is a you know, reputable discipline, but the results were not there. Um, you know, you can still publish papers, um, but um, they cannot be used uh, in real applications. One of the reasons is because the difference between the performance of machine and the performance of humans are, you know, the gap is huge, right? So I remember that before 2010, uh, when you ask a computer to recognize images, the best well, for a you know uh, you know significant large um, data uh, database, um, the best performance computer uh, you know computer program can only recognize thirty percent you know uh, lower than thirty percent accuracy uh, for a computer to recognize oh this is an image of a cow or car and so on and so forth, but you know human brain can recognize you know with very high accuracy you know up to more than 85 to 90 percent. So something happened, uh, you know, between 
uh, before 2010 and after 2010. I will say that you know that is you know really the watershed moment of artificial intelligence that also has a huge impact in many many other uh, areas in, in in computer science. Um, I think that uh, you know your host uh, correctly mentioned highlight three key things that happened uh, after 2010. Uh, you know, one thing is the, the number one thing is that we have very, very fast hardware. So um, we have, you know, uh, uh, computer um, uh, programs that can be run very, very fast on uh, a GPU, graphical uh, user interface, uh, gra uh, graphical processors units, so that, uh, you know, uh, now you can have the algorithm to be massively parallel uh, to be able to provide the analysis that is needed um, to be able to um, execute certain type of, uh, of functions. So um, what I see to, you know, extrapolate from the history is that, uh, you know, I will see that, uh, you know, the, the development for much, much faster and the parallelizable on hardware will continue to grow, right? One of the things is the Moore's law. You guys probably have heard about the Moore's law is that every 18 months, the amount of uh, transistors uh, in the same area, you know, will double. So that actually is a kind of like a, a empirical guarantee that a computer will grow faster and faster. So um, Berkeley in this area has made you know significant uh, uh, contribution. Uh, in fact, that uh, you know uh, one of the uh, invention from the Berkeley uh, from Berkeley actually um, uh, really uh, help the industry to be able to continue to provide you know sub. 10 nanometer uh, processors to be able to you know, crank out more uh, numbers. And I, I will say that the second thing uh, is open source software. And uh, we have seen the explosion of available soft, uh, softwares in open source format. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, I, I know that you guys probably have heard that the Microsoft, you know, one, one of the most closed uh, you know, uh, ecosystem company acquired the GitHub. Uh, GitHub is the number one open source um, uh, platform in uh, in the world. So um, it, it really shows that you know the dedication of the future uh, is open source. So which means that uh, for our student, um, if we want to participate in the future trend of computer science and especially for artificial intelligence, we need to actually get into this movement of open source. Um, it, the, the open source platform, the, the 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 movement is not just a legal term. And it's also not just you know like engineering uh, uh, engineering uh, protocols. Um, I, I I think it's a culture that you know uh, thinking about uh, what you are making is not for yourself. It's not for you to publish an app on iOS or uh, or, or 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 a website. Instead, um, so your contribution should be shared by all the people online, so that when you provide something, all other people can very easily integrate. Uh, your contribution into their project. I think that really helped to uh, accelerate the development of artificial intelligence. I think the last one is the applications, right? So all I have talked about are you know, technical jargons. Um, if you are not starting in computer science, you probably will never need to know. But however, um, everybody now knows about AI and either you are excited about AI or you are a little bit nervous about AI. Um, I think the reason you have this is because now you can you know, touch AI, you can feel AI, you can see AI. Um, if you have Alexa in your home, um, you actually hear AI. Um, you know, if you have uh, Tesla can do autonomous driving, you sit on an AI environment and then you can feel AI. So I think that the third one is really the explosion um, of, uh, of, of, of more and more applications. Um, I think one of them is um, autonomous driving. I think that out of uh, you know, so many applications, if you really look at the market, the autonomous, you know, the, the automobile industry is the biggest, uh, you know, granddaddy of many, many other uh, industry. So if artificial intelligence really uh, renovate, uh, you know, revolutionize this area to make the future of cars to be, you know, uh, more and more percentage to be autonomous, I think that that's really uh, a big change to our society. It's as big as, you know, we are changing from people riding horses, riding uh, in horse-driven car, carts into you know, motorcycles. I think the, the, the transition of the society will be as big as that. Uh, I think that uh, really um, uh, in order for us to, um, uh, to, uh, to, um, to meet that uh, trend, um, I think that at Berkeley, um, I will just open up. Uh, I think we will have more uh, questions to follow that, is that we also feel 
the urgency, you know, as educators is how can we um, provide educational programs and how can we uh, educate our students to meet the challenges of all these moving parts, very rapid moving parts, so that not only they can be the future of engineers, the future of employee of a company, but really a tech leaders, a leader, uh, a thought leader, a, a technical leader uh, for you know innovating in particular uh, application and markets that utilize the knowledge of AI. Uh, I think that you know I will you know first summarize what I you know thought about um, the first question like this. Well, I'm so excited. You know, I, I think the like many students, you know, they're interested in the computer science. So basically, you also answer the second question. Like, computer science definitely gonna be hot in the next ten years, right? And AI as mm -hmm. computer science, and it's gonna be like uh, more and more uh, opportunities, you know, offered. And especially, it's like a kind of like a revolution for the human society. Uh, so, you know, I even want to learn AI. I don't know if it's too late. So the third question is, what is the best age to start learning about like this computer science and AI? Am I too late? Or right. what really is the stage? Right. So I will answer the first, two, uh, I will answer the next two questions together. Um, I mean, um, I, I think it's a great question to ask whether computer science major will be hot in the next 10 years. Um, I think compared to all the other uh, disciplines, I think computer science is, is a fairly young. I mean, so if you, you know, most people will say that computer science actually was a, was a spinoff from electrical engineering. So they, they were electrical engineering, you know, uh, uh, you know technicians, uh, uh, you know, before and then can the computer science. I think in the next 10 years, um, computer science will definitely um, accelerate a lot because there, um, you know, there are significant trends uh, moving upward you will be much, much faster than, you know, when I graduated with my PhD, de PhD degree. The number one is automation. A lot of things uh, currently are, you know, uh, repeated jobs will be automated, uh, you know, by artificial intelligence. I think that is really, um, you know, think about how many jobs that can be, you know, replaced. You know, people, you know, you, um, you guys probably have heard that Amazon has already prototyping uh, a, you know, cashier free, uh, supermarkets. So in the future, they will no, they will have no cashiers. In fact, a lot of most of our um, uh, banking branches uh, have less and less cashiers, and you all do your transactions in a uh, in a machine, right? Um, so that's number one automation. And the second one is, you know, um, you know, m m many of you have watched, uh, you know, SpaceX launch uh, uh, of of their uh, of their rockets with the human, you know, human uh, uh, um, astronauts on board. I mean, the combination of, you know, the technology we develop uh, on Earth and then the future of going to uh, the moon, to Mars, um, also need, uh, you know, really state-of-the-art computer science. So one thing that I can, you know, uh, illustrate uh, is how can we see a doctor, you know, when we are, you know, in the outer space? And in fact, so the same question we can ask is, you know, how do we see the doctor, you know, when we are in the pandemic, you know, everybody is stuck at home and even the doctors are stuck at home and uh, they cannot uh, very easily go to um, a uh, surgery room uh, to see patients for some exploratory uh, uh, surgeries. Um, these are the questions that we are actually asking, um, uh, you know, right now. I think the third one, why computer science will continue to be hard is really um, combining computer science with biology is human brain interface. So the biggest computer you have in your home is your brain. But however, why our brain um, still, you cannot use your brain to you know, control uh, other uh, uh, you know, electronics in, in your home. The reason is because the connection, the connection from your, home, uh, from your brain to other devices, you know, I make an example, is your remote. So think about how much bandwidth your brain has versus how much bandwidth that you you know you can how fast you can type on your remote. So this interface is is band limiting um, how your brain can you know see uh, receive information and also being able to control other things. So um, the third one I think we're really making computer science much much bigger exponentially bigger is combining computer science as a engineering uh, domain. Uh, and then a biology or bioengineering uh, engineering as a traditional science domain. Uh, and, uh, and for all these uh, areas, and we um, have, um, you know, research groups uh, very actively uh, pursuing this, uh, these areas um, in Berkeley. And uh, another reason I know about this is because these are the, you know, the pillar research directions that, uh, you know, currently, you know, um, I, uh, you know, I was a co-director. Uh, I am the co-director at Berkeley 
called the Vive Center. These are the areas that we have, by talking to so many professors at Berkeley, we have identified that really, if you want to advance for the next generation of computer science, what would that be? Okay, now going back to Jun, uh, Jun's uh, uh, question about what's the best age to learn AI, okay. So this is a really loaded question. Uh, again, so I will record uh, my experience when I start learning uh, Apple, you know, programming at Apple II. Um, um, uh, just like a baby, you know, if you want to learn something, you need to acquire um, a language. Without a language, you, your brain really cannot, you know, uh, process information and cannot process uh, knowledge. So I think that the, the first step for uh, learning, uh, you know, in general computer science, but more particularly, you know, artificial intelligence is to learn a language to describe um, the, the information and then the knowledge. Um, so I think that from very young age, uh, from my experience, I think that uh, you know students should be able to start learning uh, a good programming language. I started learning, you know, I wouldn't say that I, I started learning uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I will come back to that. Um, but I think that definitely, uh, you know, from elementary school, um, the students can uh, started to uh, learn about programming, uh, and then you know, uh, in a step by step fashion. Uh, once the students uh, uh, can comfortably uh, program. Um, you know, at certain level, and then we can ex uh, um, expose uh, students with the, a little bit theory uh, of artificial inter intelligence up to the point that I think that um, at the entry level to the mastering level uh, of artificial intelligence uh, at, at Berkeley, you know, from my personal experience, um, if they are highly motivated students in high school, um, and then combine with their math courses, you know, uh, 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 linear solving linear equations and so on and so forth um, will be um, a good starting point to learn some basic theory um, of artificial in intelligence up to the entry level or mezzanine level. So think about AI um, as a AP class, um, you know, advanced placement class that you can learn the first two years um, of uh, of you know AI uh, uh, courses uh, at the university if you know you have. The energy, and then you have, you know, the, the background uh, to be able to do that, uh, just like any other uh, AP classes. It's not for everyone, but I think that certainly uh, will be for uh, those students. They are very well prepared. I see. So does that mean, like, you know, if you are high school students and you, you know, because you want to learn computer science, everybody want to go Berkeley, right? Berkeley is like top top school for computer science. So does that mean, like, in high school, if you learn like some like entry level for AI, uh, it gonna give you more advantages. We know like right now the high school student, they learn like the computer science, like Java, like AP, uh, APCS, you know, APCS principle, uh, things like that. So do you suggest them to learn more like AI, like you mentioned, like the entry level co like courses to give them the more advantages for uh, when it- Yeah, so, I, so that's a really great question. I want to actually expand it a little bit. Um, going into, um, you know, um, um, I think a lot of people have, you know, going to universities like Berkeley in their mind. Um, and, you know, you guys probably uh, are familiar with the application process more than I do, you know, uh, because I have applied, you know, to a university for, for uh, you know, quite a while. And, uh, but I think that number one um, is to really to find, I think the uh, high school is really uh, a good time to really think about, you know, start thinking about what will be your career, right? So AI is a tool, just like chemistry, right? So um, you learn chemistry for something. You buy a car just not for have parking a car in your garage. Similarly, you learn about AI not for putting some AI textbook in your, um, in your backpack or earning a certificate. Um, it's for um, your career. So what will be the career? What will be something that, you know, interests you? Would you want to see um, a machine that have conversations with human? Um, do you want to see that? Um, do you want to see um, the future of medicine that a lot of diagnosis can be done, um, uh, you know, uh, autonomously? Or, you know, do you want to fly with uh, Elon Musk to go to Mars, right? I think that the high school really is the, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the time that, you know, people starting thinking about um, what do you want to see themselves? I think that only when they know how to see themselves and so that they will starting to backtrack and say that, oh, if I want to do this, what should be the tools in my backpack, right? So AI is a tool in your backpack, um, but you want to know, you know, you know, if you're going to go hiking today, are you going to, you know, where are you going? 
Um, so um, for, um, for, for people who want to see those applications, um, AI definitely is something that is very, very useful. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, um, I think that the, you know, the society will force people to either be abandoned, which means that you know, if you think that you can still do repetitive jobs, so those jobs will be no more. So there is a pressure uh, of the society as a whole that really um, try to push you know, human beings as a species to you know, take a more and more challenging job. So think about the human society. A lot, you know, a lot of jobs has disappeared. So um, in some sense, you know, you have to take the lead to decide, you know, where you are going. Otherwise, the society is going to make the decision for you. And uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, your experience will be a lot tougher if the society decides for you that you know what you wanted to do may not be, you know, really a high-paying job or may not be the making the, the highest impact. But at the same time, you know, if um, you think about something that you know um, the rest of the society at our generation have never thought about, uh, and then you can lead that. Um, so that will really be something that you know um, can uh, can contribute to the society. And I think that uh, um, uh, answering this question, um, I think one of the driving force for changing the society is AI, right? So because I mentioned three things: number one is automation, and number two is uh, is the space. And number three is getting, you know, getting to know more about our brain. And all this intersects with artificial intelligence. Um, and then uh, answering, really answering the question, um, uh, how can a student to learn AI in high school? And I will say that uh, number one is to really to learn Python. Because um, uh, why, why Python? There are many, many languages. You know, am I biased about Python? Um, the reason is because it was uh, you know, anointed um, because of this open source, uh, open source movement. The Python, I think, is the number number one open source uh, language that really overtook C, C++, and uh, and the Java. Uh, initially, Python was not the program for for artificial intelligence, but because it's open source, so you know people um, you know later took over the path of Python and then repositioned it um, you know to a new path into a, a standard language in artificial intelligence. And also, you know, um, learning Python program guarantee that you are not being control bound by any corporations. You know, corporations come and go, uh, but, you know, really, um, I think that the open source uh, movement is getting more and more, uh, more and more bigger. And another thing is, I think that learning open source will force you to work with the, work as a team with other people because you know the very nature of open source is because you want other people to share uh, your work so which means that uh, your thought will not be a closed uh, you know like um, and then will be more open so you will see what other people have thought about this program and then you can easily compare your thought process your design of a problem with some other people's design and and then uh, the society as a whole will choose the winner uh, you know, not by, you know, anointing someone, but really by, uh, you know, the, the, you know, market or the society as a whole. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, um, for students to start learning about AI, I'm going back to what I said, um, really to learn Python. Um, and then the second one is, uh, once you think that, uh, you know, you are also very comfortable to do some linear, uh, linear algebra, you know, solving, uh, linear equations of multiple, uh, you know, multiple variables, uh, and then probably some students have already learned about uh, representation in matrix, matrix representation and vector representation of uh, of linear equations. Uh, I think those will be um, the mathematical tools for learning the next level of AI. The good thing about AI is it only need linear algebra, uh, and uh, people can learn about linear algebra in high school, in AP courses or in the first year of, of colleges, um, it doesn't need really sophisticated, you know, differential geometry and so on and so forth and jump, uh, mumbo jumbo to learn about AI. Python, linear algebra, and then that's it. It's very easy to start. Yes, yes, great. So which means like if you are a freshman or senior, uh, so you just you have chance to, you know, learn your uh, like a you know basic a computer science course and plus go for the AI entry level courses and that can give you more opportunity to explore more to make sure if you mm -hmm. want to do that direction and uh, yeah remember Dr. Allen just told us right either you're gonna 
you know, develop the AI to repl replace yourself in the future, or you're waiting to be replaced by the AI created by some others, okay? So that's basically no option, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, I think the, there are two questions that we want to combine together due to the time. And uh, basically, a lot of students, they ask me about the possibility for the CS major. Uh, so we know, mm -hmm. like, the CS major is, like, very broad, right? So, like you mentioned, you can study computer science and then uh, work in the Wall Street, right? So doing finance, right? Totally the different thing. Uh, so how, uh, what is the possibility for the CS major? So basically, uh, if the student want to switch from one major to computer science, should they study math as a major or is, should they study physics as a major? Uh, what would be the best way for them to, to do the transfer? Well, so yeah, so um, I think one thing that uh, um, I want to extrapolate to what I uh, what I talk about is that uh, you know everybody you know uh, whether you want to apply for a college or you want to you know transfer you know from one college to another college or transfer from degree to another degree, um, in addition to your um, scores, your uh, you know your your coursework, the number one thing that you know the the committee a committee will see is your resume. Uh, it's not your resume. It's your statement, a statement of purpose. So in that statement of purpose, if you can really elaborate why, you know, why you want to make this as your career. So the committee, as far as I know, will really see that your thought process of, uh, you know, how you understand your education and has relationship with the career, uh, with, with your career. And uh, every committee want to help students to build up their career as long as you have a clear understanding of what your career is. So in that sense, whether you are going straight to, you know, ECS in Berkeley and equally, you know, uh, qualify to, you know, other universities, you know, I wouldn't, you know, say that Berkeley is number one for everything, um, or you want to go to physics um, first, you go to do chemistry first, you go to do biology first, and then you want to switch um, to, um, uh, to computer science. I think the number one is understand why. I think the, the, the number one uh, uh, thing is understand yourself. And then the number two thing is, you know, we are in a society, so we have to follow the rules. Uh, you have to understand how the rules were set up for a university that allow you to transfer. Um, for example, in Berkeley, there are two different CS majors. Number one is in ECS, uh, in the college engineering. So um, traditionally, it has the highest score for um, uh, entering into that department. And then there is a, another CS uh, uh, a degree uh, in science uh, in science and letter. Um, so in over there, uh, it's emphasizing more like the interdisciplinary uh, pre uh, plenary and emphasizing the science of computer science more than the engineering part. Um, and uh, for students in the science and letters uh, track, to choose a CS, then you know uh, you guys can uh, uh, refer to the rule book over there, and then there are certain requirements that uh, you probably have to perform and guarantee that um, you know you can achieve that in the first two years. Uh, at least that's what what's going on in Berkeley. Um, so that you know even in let, uh, uh, science and letters, uh, you can um, uh, decide to, to uh, declare CS uh, as your major uh, in. Uh, in that college versus in the College of Engineering. I see, I see. Uh, so we want to just, uh, you know, wrap up the questions with the last one, and then we move forward for uh, like some specific question from the students. So what industry in a uh, computer science jobs or languages will become absolute because of AI and what new economies will emerge as a consequence? I think this is a huge question. Um, yeah, just the, Alan, just to share, share some of your thoughts. And uh, I think majorly the first part because the economy, you know, what's gonna be the consequence? And I think right now nobody can predict, right? Because, you know, the COVID-19, um, you know, the, 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 the everything together. So basically um, a lot of things affect the economy. So uh, what, what do you think about the industry? How, you know, what kind of language will be very absolute because of AI? Yeah, so that's really a big, uh, a big question. I wouldn't dare to say that I know the answer to that. Um, but I think that uh, I will repeat something that, you know, uh, I hopefully as a consensus, but, you know, uh, as a warning, that consensus is never the truth. Uh, it's just more people saying this way than other people. Um, I think that the consensus is number one is re repetitive jobs will be replaced by AI. Uh, I mentioned about cashiers. I, may, uh, I, you know, I mentioned about supermarkets. I mentioned, uh, I, I mentioned about uh, many other things. So um, replaced by what? I think uh, replaced by more creative jobs. 
So I think that in the future, the uh, one possibility, very likely possibility, is that the basic infrastructure of the human society uh, will be uh, will be controlled by AI. Um, so all these repeated jobs, um, but the human, uh, uh, you know, human will be taking, uh, you know, jobs uh, to be more uh, more creative, more design driven uh, kind of thing. So I think that that's really really important. Um, uh, number two is, uh, you know, um, uh, Jun mentioned about um, investment. And more and more uh, investment right now are being done by by, by computers. Um, they are actually less uh, traders uh, uh, right now in uh, in Wall Street um, than you know seventy or eighty percent of the uh, of the transactions uh, in finance uh, you know um, is executed by machines rather than by humans. And over there, there you know um, a combination of a lot of hot topics in computer science, you know, including you know Bitcoin and the blockchain and, and so on and so forth. And I know I, I, you know, I wouldn't say that, you know, um, I'm the expert uh, in that area. Uh, and then going back to, you know, what I have been preaching is, uh, you know, the, um, the computer science that support exploration of uh, outer space uh, and also the combination of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, brain machine interface. I see. Okay. So uh, we know, like, uh, we heard, like, uh, actually last uh, open class that we invite you and you mentioned about, like, the, uh, the the competition for the AI in Berkeley. So it's supposed to happen right. right? because of COVID-19, it put it off to the December, which is the end of this year. Uh, so right. actually, uh, from serving you and from like, uh, you know, outside of different kind of uh, places, the students asked me, uh, they're so interested in like how to participate in this kind of, you know, racing and do they have to, you know, set up the team and do they, right. uh, is it Right. So let me let me explain a little. Yeah, let me explain a little bit about the raw program. So um, we really see that uh, um, the the matured uh, automobile industry will be uh, having the next revolution, which is uh, fully autonomous cars, uh, and then it will fundamentally change the society. You know, even in the future, all your deliveries will be you know we will be provided to you by cars, by autonomous cars, not even by DoorDash and and so on and so forth. But on the other hand. Uh, uh, research in uh, AI has become more and more expensive, more and more expensive uh, to, the, uh, to the point that uh, even, in, even in a university, if you want to buy a so-called AI machine, you have to spend like $10,000 to buy a machine that you know, uh, has, uh, can call itself AI machine. Uh, and let alone for autonomous driving that you know, companies have to put in billions and billions of dollars um, to, to just get a fleet of cars uh, uh, running on the uh, on the road. So as educators, uh, we want to uh, we want to um, think about uh, how can we provide opportunities for for students to participate uh, in this area uh, and not putting students through a five four year college plus five years PhD and then by you know by year nine you graduate with a PhD degree this whole you just missed the whole train uh, and then all the cars are already autonomous and you just missed it. So, um, so we developed uh, this platform, Coroba Open Autonomous Driving. So it is combining research, education, and also fun. So, um, so we laid a racetrack um, in the center of Berkeley. Um, and then the, we manufacture a small car. And you guys can search to Raw and Berkeley. Um, if you are a you know, really hands-on person, uh, and then you have done some uh, 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 engineering work about RC cars, radio control cars, Arduino and so on and so forth. Um, following our open source, you know, it's also open source, open source instructions, you can put a car together that has basic autonomous driving capabilities for about $1,000. So, so this hitting also the price point is really something that we think is important to provide more opportunities for students to learn about AI. Now, because our platform is open source, that, in, uh, that enable two things. Number one is um, our students are continuing to build uh, more and more functionalities for autonomous driving on this platform. So if you have a compatible platform with our platform, then um, you can download um, our new function as soon as we make them available. And so all these developers will be automatically made available to all the people. So that's the power of autonomous driving. And the second one is uh, surrounding this raw platform, um, we are hosting, like Jim was saying, we are hosting a competition. So um, every education, so why, so the, the um, a education program will have, need to have a means to evaluate um, the results, the quality of education, which is 
uh, exams, right? So that's why all the courses have exams. Why? Um, because that's how you know the students are being evaluated. You know, some people hate exams, but that's the integral part um, of a education program. So in this case, uh, we are combining uh, evaluation of your knowledge uh, to uh, a really fun to participate race. So it is. We actually have two tiers. Number one is that you can race uh, with your manual control. So um, it is similar to uh, Ready Player One. So maybe some uh, some of you have watched the movie in 2018. So um, we have software that you can see your surroundings. Um, of course, the, uh, the the RC cars you cannot sit uh, sit on it by yourself, but you can virtually sit on it uh, in a virtual reality environment, just like Ready Player One. And then you can drive it and uh, compete with other people in a virtual reality environment. And then, of course, you can completely decouple um, yourself and then only act activate your program to drive the car. And then we see that in both situations, uh, who will be number one, number two, number three. And uh, we actually um, have dedicated websites to um, release the team scores um, for everyone online to see. Yes, and actually, uh, we honor we honored um, you know invite Dr. Alan Young to create a program based on this uh, competition and uh, to teach students for the Python. So actually, we do have students ask me like, uh, do you have any suggestion or recommendation about a good online classes? And I recommend Dr. Young's online classes, the Python entry level. So uh, basically, this class is, is like designed it uh, both with TA and uh, Alan Young, you know, teach by himself. Uh, so uh, Dr. Young, could you please introduce a little bit more about the philosophy of these courses and how you design it and uh, um, how students can benefit from it? Yeah, so there are, there are a lot of Python courses and then, you know, um, you guys go to Google and search for it. I think that uh, most of the courses um, have not, uh, really um, have not addressed, touch the critical point I, I talk about. The number one is we want to educate students not beginning by, you know, techniques, but really it's the thought process. I want you, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we want students to be able to think so that you know they are uh, not just thinking within the perimeter of you know taking a programming course, but really is what is programming course by learning Python for, right? So um, uh, of course our outlet for uh, coming out of this program will be uh, seamlessly to be able to um, learn the subsequent courses. That's as if like the AP courses in artificial intelligence or you know the um, the entry level to mastering level um, of artificial intelligence. So, uh, so this Python course will, will be a prerequisite for those courses. I think um, our aim is different. Number two is um, we are um, emphasizing the culture of open source. So if there's no open source, there's no Python, and then there, you know, it, I think the development of artificial intelligence will be much, much slower than today. Um, so um, in this course, we have also built in modules and components so not only the students can practice Python programming, can also practicing using Git and GitHub and naturally to form teams and then work together um, to either discuss the course or um, uh, and then doing the, you know, doing the course exercises together. Um, and these are seamlessly built in to our course. In fact, that's also true in Berkeley that in Berkeley engine, engineering schools, a lot, most of the uh, courses right now in Berkeley, if you want to engage uh, question uh, with the uh, with, with the instructors, or you want to submit uh, homeworks, um, it's all done by GitHub. So um, really, we're promoting a open source uh, open source culture to think, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, you know, naturally in a open source culture. Number three is uh, uh, Jim was mentioned uh, mentioned that uh, that we offer uh, TAs um, so that the students uh, I think will be more engaging. Uh, in terms of uh, you know raising questions and also the TAs will be helping students to organize their teams to form teams already right um, to be able to um, do um, uh, take home exercises and so on and so forth. Uh, I think this will be um, unique to our course. And then of course we are uh, in this course you are going to see much much less about being a, a website administration uh, an administrator. Uh, and then to you know, uh, calling big data from the internet. Uh, we are de-emphasizing the internet function of Python, the automation you know, of website function of Python. We are more emphasizing the data structure and then the algorithm uh, uh, that is prerequisite 
to learning AI. Ah, thank you, Dr. Yang. So uh, I was wondering what kind of students, like which grade a student can join in? Should they have some like a basic language first? Yeah. For example, you know, like Java, yeah. They yeah, it's a great question. So um, I will also relate to uh, my experience, right? Learning, learning from, uh, uh, learning programming uh, when I was in elementary school. So I will say that this course, um, preferably, uh, you will be um, a student that have already acquired um, uh, e uh, experience and skills about how to operate a computer, right? Um, our course will have much, much, um, you know, much, much. Um, uh, uh, less time dedicated for teaching students to open a terminal and you know what's the difference uh, you know uh, in C drive uh, and D drive if you are using Windows or you know the root uh, directory and how to you know how to create a directory uh, in Linux or uh, in Mac. Um, so uh, of course, if you have those general questions, um, we will always you know the TAs uh, will love to help you. But it's just we don't have structured courses if you need to learn about operating computers. And then on top of that, if you have already learned a uh, programming language, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, of course, it doesn't have to be Python. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, like C or C++, but any programming language that you know what is a variable and what is an assignment and what is a loop. I think that will really help you to, um, you know, to, to, to learn about um, the scientific programming part versus the basic, uh, uh, the basic grammar part um, of a language like Python. I see, I see. Uh, so there's a, one more question. Actually, it's a lot, lot of students they care about. So we know like it's, this is like a summer camp. So starting from June 15 to August the 21st. So what's next? Like after students finish the, uh, the classes for the Python entry level classes with you. So what, what they gonna expect next? So they're gonna do self study right. You have some other classes. Yeah, right. So Yes. So um, as I said, you know, you know, uh, small as as small as Python, as big as AI, we always want to teach students, you know, to understand where they are going, right? So I I I cannot say, uh, you know, one bit that you know individual students, uh, you know, what can be their career. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to lecture people about careers. Um, so I think that uh, what we have built is very purpose driven because um, we see the opportunity in combining AI and automation. So um, the, um, the future direction of learning from Python is that uh, uh, we are building uh, a curriculum um, that also apply to Berkeley uh, students that after they have finished the Python, then uh, in terms of the rigorous uh, 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 curriculum um, of, 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 of a program, that there are two extra steps. I will say that after Python, then um, the students will be ready to learn about the introduction of artificial intelligence. And then you know, we are emphasizing the modern uh, the, the theory of artificial intelligence, including computer vision and including neural networks and deep learning. Uh, I think that these are really driving forces of artificial intelligence. And then at the top level, um, and then a the student will be entering into the level that is similar to uh, the senior. Uh, so that those are the, 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 the courses that we develop for even for uh, undergrad and master students in Berkeley um, uh, is to uh, to further their understanding in two parts. Number number one is industrial design, product design, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and the hardware um, of autonomous driving. So you will know how to design the look and feel of a autonomous driving car, and then you will know uh, you will learn Arduino, you will learn Jetson Nano, Linux, and so on and so forth. And then, uh, and and the second part is uh, more, uh, you know, uh, more uh, advanced topics in machine learning, which is you want to design very special behavior uh, for your car that based on an algorithm. So uh, to summarize, uh, I see there are three tiers. The basic tier is Python, uh, and I think that uh, that course should be accessible for most people. And then on top of that, the the mezzanine level will be introduction to artificial intelligence. As I mentioned, the prerequisite for the, the mezzanine level will be two things. Number one is Python, and number two is linear algebra. So if you uh, know how to solve linear equations, if you know matrix and vectors, and you will be more than ready to, to take that course. And you know whether you are high school or you are, you're entering a college, it's the same. And then on top of that, really, um, you know, that is more advanced, I will say, projects or research is hardware design 
and software design. So that will, you know, bifurcate into two parts, two directions. You know, it depends on whether you are a hardware person or a software person. Rarely I see a, a person that can do hardware and, and, and software together. And, uh, you know, some people are really good at, you know, making hardware and some people are really good at making software. So I think at the high level, once the students have learned about the basics, they will make a determination that whether they want to go for hardware or they want to go for software. That's great. So basically, uh, they can just figure out their direction uh, through this program. And also, uh, one more advantage, uh, we say uh, Dr. Alan Yong is teaching in Berkeley. So if you join this class, basically, you can also learn the things uh, uh, like whatever he teaches in the Berkeley and also can just get it some part of the, the knowledge is in this class. OK, so now we go to the Q&A section. And actually, there's a question for, waiting for us. Uh, thank you for your patience. The first question, I, I, I won't follow the order. So I just uh, grab uh, like single one. And uh, the first one is, if I learned Python first, will it affect me learning other programming language in a good ways or in bad ways? Um, that's, uh, that's a question. I think that is, uh, is, uh, is different, uh, from person to person. I will say that Python is, uh, uh you know, one of the, uh, language that is very, very easy to learn. So it's good to be your first language. And also it is sufficiently modern. Uh, for example, uh, in the sense that it is also an object oriented, uh, 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 uh uh, uh, language and also it uh, fully supports open source, so um, you will be able to you know get exposure exposure um, you know to the basics modern programming language um, versus if you stick with the, you know in C or even in Java. So um, I think that uh, you know um, I think you will learn a lot of good habits um, that will really help you to adopt um, other languages uh, from learning Python. Yeah, so basically there's no good way or bad way. So it's just a different language. So if you learn this first, then you also can learn something later. Or you learn something like other language, then you can also learn Python. There's nothing about yeah. like good or bad. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I, I want to jump back to this question. Just one more thing, uh, one, one, more, one more example, right? So I heard about people saying about, you know, if you learn C, you may learn some bad habit about C um, because the C really encourage you to be really succinct and really make shortcuts. Uh, and then those habits tend to be, you know, uh, prone to error. But however, for Python, if you follow their, you know, programming guideline, of course, you, if you develop your own language, no, nobody else understand what you're writing, you know, too bad. But, you know, if you're really in open source society, then you write the code as if, you know, just as other people write it the way, um, I think that you will learn a lot of good habits. And then you are less likely to learn bad habits. That's great. By, by, by staying in, in Python. Yeah, so we have another uh, question. What knowledge can this course help me learn better in college? Is that limited to the computer science only? Well, so um, um, I think that Python is really the de facto um, language for um, a lot of disciplines now. And um, for example, if you want to learn about um, bioengineering, so if you want to uh, learn about data science, um, and I think that the, the, the Python is the really the, the de facto uh, language um, other than other than you know other than computer science. Okay, uh, we have one more question. Say, uh, it's about the competition. Can raw competition hold the in uh, virtualus virtual racing league or AWS deep racing? Right. So that's a really great question. You know, we we um, um, so there is a uh, prior um, program than raw, which was uh, completely developed just for the benefit of students taking courses in Berkeley. So it's like a course project. Um, since last year, uh, we started to see the benefit about developing this raw platform that only has about $1,000 price point, and then being able to open up for competition, uh, not just for Berkeley, but uh, outside uh, for Berkeley. So I think that uh, uh, what, we are, what we are going to do here uh, is really to uh, including more students to be, uh, in, to be in this platform. I see. Uh, one more question. Do you plan to offer a machine learning or AI class for who already have learned Python this summer? So because this program right. is for entry level. Right, right? so, it, right. so um, I think that's a great question. So that leads to what I said before is, 
um, um, we have a curriculum that Python is, you know, you can say that a prerequisite or you can say the first class, you know, depending on you call the first class number one or number zero. But uh, if you, your goal is to learn AI, then, you know, I, I will say that our first course will be uh, the introduction to, to modern artificial intelligence theory and applications. So, so there will be another course that naturally follows the Python course. I see. Okay. All right. So do you have Python sessions in other different dates, like lecture on Tuesday and a Thursday? I think for the more class detail uh, questions, you can always call uh, our phone number and uh, 408-387-3034 or 408-216-9109 for a more detailed and like a de for the detailed information. So we're going to ask uh, another question. What activities, grades, etc., can add a chance for college application to to admit it by AI major. Hmm. So, right, so that's really a, a, a loaded question. Um, I think that uh, um, at Berkeley, although I think it's great that if you, um, if you um, can really make a case that uh, you, you want to dedicate your career in artificial intelligence, but uh, I think that the community in the university will look much, much um, deeper than that, because as I said, um, at least to me, uh, AI is a tool. It's a tool in your book, uh, in your in your backpack. But where are you going? So, uh, what do you see that AI can help society? Right. Uh, I think that is that is the important thing. Um, and then in terms of the curriculum, um, currently there, you know, when you go to a, I assume that we're talking about college. Um, um, so there's no fast track to AI. You still have to learn all the other, uh, all the other very basic theory of computer science, right? Whether you like it or not, you know, even if you are, you know, high conviction for AI, you still have to learn that. The reason is because um, universities don't want you to be a specialist uh, in the first year of your college degree because uh, you may miss, uh, you know, um, you will miss the opportunity to interact with other people to exchange. Um, your your thought process to other people. So I think that even if you are you have high conviction in artificial intelligence, so you will still go through uh, a very broad uh, education program, uh, at least in Berkeley, um, whether it is in engineering or is in the you know in letter and science. Um, they all want to make sure that your first two years will be very very solid uh, with uh, you know a variety of uh, of basic theories. Okay, so I want to add a little bit more for this question. So um, basically, you can't really, um, you know, give the formula about what kind of, you know, grades, etc. activities. So if I could, I, I wish I can give the formula so everybody can follow the formula. Uh, however, uh, you know, AI major or different kind of major is all about a student's passion. So, you know, if the students is passionate about, you know, the computer science, you know, about AI, about changing the human society in the future by developing AI and replace the jobs, um, if this is something the students into it, I think, you know, they would you know, pursue the related activity. And of, of course, this related to like, you know, uh, courses like math, like, uh, you know, CS, it has to be good grades, right? Because, you know, um, you have to be good, right? Then you order to pursue the major. So I was also say like, you know, trying to um, give them the more chance to try to explore so they can tell if they um, have the passion on that. And if the student have passion, then usually they will become like very self-motivated. Uh, so this is something I, I hope can help you out. Uh, there's another yeah. question say, will AP computer science principles be more useful than AP CSA? I think this is more like high school. Um, so I would say, uh, what do you think, Dr. Allen, about an AP computer science also with AP. Well, yeah, so I think, I think, uh, I, I think, June, you are the expert to that, but I want to go back, just taking a little bit time to going back to answer uh, the question that I, I don't think that uh, I fully answered the previous question. I think that uh, it's great to think about, you know, um, whether AI can be your career, but I think that thinking is not, uh, thinking alone is not enough. If you put your thought process in, in a statement, I think that's great, um, but it will be more convincing if you have act on it. So which means that if you, uh, you, you don't have to say, right? So you don't have to say that, oh, you know, I am 100% sure I'm going to do AI. But you can say that, oh, you know, I understand that AI is a very promising area in order to understand two things. Number one is 
I want to get some uh, understanding about the, uh, I mean, I, I think the foundation of AI. At the same time, I want to understand myself. So I have taken action uh, to learn about uh, some prerequisite, and then I potentially can do a, you know, like the course project, uh, applying my knowledge to some interesting aspect of that. Uh, you know, I have seen a variety of, uh, of summer projects uh, by students uh, of learning Python and learning AI and learning raw platform, learning Arduino, and then learning how to, grant, uh, how to program motors. And they can create a lot of fun projects that really, you know, that really put meats and bones uh, into your statement uh, versus, uh, you know, just thinking about it. I see. Uh, last question from Susan. Uh, will this Python course teach the machine learning and deep learning? Um, right. So um, the machine learning and deep learning will be covered in a subsequent course, um, uh, what we call the introduction to modern machine learning and applications. And the reason is because there is a distinction about uh, learning Python versus machine learning. Um, and then some people are e very eager to learn about uh, a deep learning uh, and neural networks. But however, the prerequisite uh, for people to learn Python and prerequisite for people to learn uh, machine learning are different. Um, so that uh, you know, uh, we actually um, have uh, uh, put frameworks to make the, pro uh, to the program to be self-sustained. So which means that if you learn about Python, uh, we wouldn't require you to learn about matrix man manipulation and linear algebra. And versus um, if you are in a higher uh, course, then we will assume that uh, uh, you have learned about Python so that you know, our um, corresponding 20 hours course wouldn't you know, spending a lot of time uh, to help uh, students to play catch up um, for Python. Then they should know Python by heart and then you know, use Python as a tool but focusing on more, uh, more higher level questions. I see. And actually, the last question is very interesting. Uh, it's from a Taylor uh, saying, in pandemic like COVID-19, we desperately need effective treatment for the COVID, you know, co coronavirus, right? So how AI can help speed up the developing new treatment or finding existing treatment? Uh, what is your thoughts? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I don't think that, the, you, know, uh, you know, to the, to the, you know, to the boundary of uh, my limited knowledge, and I don't think that currently the AI is being actively, uh, uh, you know, de deployed to uh, to develop the vaccine or the treatment. Um, the reason is because um, at least for the current uh, healthcare industry, it has not been revolutionized by artificial intelligence. So I think that currently the doctor that I have engaged with, um, you know, because the whole UC system also have great hospitals. Um, they are thinking about how they can still provide quality services uh, to patients remotely. So in that, uh, uh, in that case, um, so um, people in artificial, intelligence, uh, in, in artificial intelligence are thinking about um, changing the workflow uh, of, page, of patients receiving all, all kinds of treatments if they are in the situation that a, 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 a hospital is closed. And, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think in general, uh, AI is revolutionized the, 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 the medical uh, industry. Uh, and then we have active projects, uh, you, know, if, uh, you know, if students are interested. Um, so this really is a focus area that we have a lot of uh, conviction that's to see that it moves in the direction uh, that really help uh, the, the, the future um, uh, patients. But uh, to my knowledge, uh, the development of vaccines and also the treatments for uh, for coronavirus is still very very traditional. You have to go through uh, uh, phase one, phase two, phase three trials, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the development of the in the development of the RNA uh, uh, treatments, you know, we have leading companies doing that. But I don't think that you know uh, those are um, qualified as uh, AI products. And I think this is a good chance for. Uh, for you to have the conversation with the students, right, with the kids. Maybe they have some like a better 
uh, knowledge or imagination, or maybe our future can, um, let, you know, rely on them. So I think, it, you know, this, this is a very interesting question. And thank you for asking for the question. And uh, thank you again for Alan for your time. And uh, if you have any question related to the Python, like AI, and welcome to contact us to write down your questions. And uh, if possible, we can try to invite Alan back, you know, to give like more specific explanation about AI, about the future. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank Glad you. to meet you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Make sure you check out our social media channels as well, by the way. I'll repost them right now in the chat so that you can go ahead and just click follow on any of them. And if you guys need to reach out to us, make sure you guys save those numbers on the screen right now. And, you know, and Make sure that you come to our next open class. I put the registration right in the chat. So yeah, you don't next, want to miss that. We're going to be dissecting some of the hardest passages in SAT reading. Yeah, next so. uh, class will be, uh, I will invite like the famous New Oriental teacher and a very experienced in the reading section. We'll share some strategy for the historical passage, which is like the headache for most of the students. All right, we're going to see you next time. And a thank you for joining our today's open class. And thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Alan. And we're going to see you next time. Have a great night. Happy weekend. Bye. Good night.